Well, actually, I'm fairly often asked to talk about animal language and uh, even more frequently read about it. In fact, an hour, an hour ago, you know, got my office at MIT in a recent issue of one of the leading cognitive science journals about the language of the blue-nosed dolphin. Uh, every time the topic comes up, what comes to my mind, uh, first of all, I'm puzzled, because it's not clear that the topic even exists. Uh, in fact, I think it's pretty clear that it doesn't exist for a number of reasons. And uh, the one thing that a broad and narrow, uh, on the broad part, what immediately comes to my mind when I hear the words, or a human language is a different matter. That's a biological system. We can talk about it the way we can talk about the visual system. Uh, but uh, animal language is a different kind of thing. Uh, what comes to my mind then is a, a, it's a huge enterprise, the study of animal language and what it does supposedly tells us about human language. Uh, but, uh, and it's uh, reminiscent of another and even greater enterprise, which is sort of similar in some respects. Uh, that's the study of uh, uh, machine thinking. Can machines think? And maybe can they think even better than humans? And if you go on, will they take over and get rid of us and so on and so forth? Uh, that's an enormous enterprise. Uh, and it's kind of similar to this in some respects. Uh, that enterprise derives from a famous paper by uh, Alan Turing, the great mathematician and uh, one of the founders of modern computer science, a paper in... Uh, 1950, uh, with the title, like, uh, Can Machines Think? And uh, he offered a, uh, an experimental test, later came to be called the Turing test, uh, which is supposed to be, people have taken to be a test of whether machines can think. And a huge amount of effort has gone into, pass the test basically is a test as to whether a computer program can be designed that'll fool a person into thinking that it's a human under some circumstances. Uh, a, a, a huge amount of effort has gone into this. If you can figure out a way to pass the Turing test, you can win $100,000. There's a prize every year. IBM builds huge machines to try to show that uh, the machines can play chess even better than masters. And enormous enterprise. Uh, all of it is based on a failure to read one crucial sentence in Turing's eight-page paper. Namely, the question whether machines think is too meaningless to deserve discussion. Uh, he probably had in mind an aphorism of his friend Wittgenstein, who pointed out around that time that uh, just said in his aphoristic way that humans think maybe dolls and spirits. Uh, what he meant to, to imply is uh, the term thinking, it's not a technical term of the sciences, it's a term of ordinary language, and its meaning is given by the way it's used in ordinary language, there's no other source. And uh, it's a term that's applied to some obscure activity that humans carried out. He, had, uh, he added, and maybe dolls and spirits, to imply if you feel like extending the metaphor somewhat, well, to things like humans, okay, but it's not a, it's not a factual question. It's a question kind of on a par with uh, whether uh, submarines swim, maybe not as well as fish, but sort of, or whether uh, humans fly, let's say, pretty well, not as well as chickens, although if you take a look at... Uh, the Olympic record for long jumping, it's uh, only an order of magnitude less than the record for chicken flying. So maybe it's humans fly too. In fact, in some languages they do. But, uh, uh, and in fact, if we studied human jumping, maybe we'd learn something about uh, birds, convince an ornithologist. Uh, the, uh, all of these are totally meaningless questions. There are questions of which metaphors you want to accept and which ones you don't want to accept. And it's uh, all kind of reasons, but there's 
There's no empirical issue. Uh, Turing was perfectly well aware of this. He, he after saying that the, the question is too meaningless to deserve discussion, he said, nevertheless, it's worth pursuing uh, whether uh, machines, machines means program, not, not the physical object, whether a machine can uh, uh, pass the, what he called the imitation test, later the Turing test. You know, he said there are two reasons. Uh, for one thing, it might stimulate uh, efforts to construct bigger machines, uh, which it probably did. And for another, he said, it's possible that uh, somewhere down the road uh, we will decide to change, to use the term think in a novel way, not in the way it's used in natural language, and we'll mean by think whatever it is that uh, pro computers programs do. Maybe, but again, it's a, it's, it's, it's a question that's too meaningless to deserve discussion. <laughs> And uh, the huge enterprise that's come out of it, those of you who happen to know the philosophical literature, you know, it's enormous there, computer science literature, engineering, and so on, uh, maybe okay, but uh, too meaningless to deserve discussion. And that's one reason why the problem, the reference to animal languages is puzzling. Uh, the question of whether animals have languages is too meaningless to deserve discussion. They have communication systems, uh, all of them. You know, bacteria communicate. Uh, you could argue that uh, flowers communicate with insects. They provide information to the insects. In fact, communication goes on all over the natural world. Uh, is it language? Well, that's uh, it's on a par with whether submarines swim. If you feel like calling it language, it's language. It's not what we call language certainly not human language. Uh, could we learn something? Uh, that's one reason why it's not a question. It's meaningless. Uh, but there's another reason. There's no such thing as animal language. I mean, even if you, there's no such thing as animal communication. There's just a lot of different systems. So what bacteria do and what vervet monkeys do and what uh, uh, dolphins do, are just different forms of communication. Uh, there may be some, there are in fact some common things about them, but uh, it's, uh, it's not a category. So for several reasons, it's odd to see the discussions about it, which are enormous, huge discussions. But we should bear in mind qualifications of this kind. Can you learn something about human language from studying these systems? Well, it's conceivable, but not particularly obvious why anyone would think so. I mean, there are, as I'm sure you know, extensive efforts to torture poor apes and uh, into kind of acting like little humans on some experimental system design. That's supposed to tell you something. I don't, I don't know why. Maybe it tells you something about ape intelligence under highly artificial conditions. Uh, but it's, there's no reason to think it's going to tell you anything about human intelligence uh, any more than... Uh, uh, training humans to jump longer will tell you something about flying. No, I'm not going to tell you anything about flying. And in fact, uh, uh, just as sensible as the so-called ape language experiments would be one that I've tried to suggest for about 50 years, but nobody wants to take up. Uh, uh, the uh, bee communication systems, as I'm sure you know, is extremely rich and complex, not very well understood waggle dance, all that. But it certainly would be possible to train uh, obedient subjects, which means graduate students who have to follow <laughs> orders of the usual subjects, you know, graduate students and secretaries, uh, to train them to uh, mimic the waggle dance, you know, train them to stand around and buzz around somewhere and uh, when one of them comes back and it goes like that. They all go off in a particular direction, and, and then they come back and do more of that, and others come and presume swarm and so on. It's kind of like the waggle dance, but uh, in fact, much more like the waggle dance than the performances of the poor uh, apes or like humans. But can you interest bee scientists in it? 
I mean, would they say, oh, great, we can learn something about uh, the nature of um, bee communication? Or, in fact, maybe we can even learn something about uh, bee, the evolution of bee communication. Because, after all, you know, nobody believes or should believe in the great chain of being anymore. The bees are just as evolved as we are. Uh, so maybe uh, what graduate students do is kind of like a primitive form of the waggle dance, and that'll teach us something about how it evolved. I mean, yeah, all of this is so ludicrous that if you say it, people properly collapse in laughter. But why is the work on ape language any different? Uh, we're not apes that continue to evolve. I mean, from the point of separation, you know, seven, eight million years ago, they evolved, we evolved different ways. Uh, way down the end of the history of human evolution, tail end, last flick of an eye, suddenly the system emerged. Uh, actually, that opens up another topic, which is again the topic of a huge literature, growing literature in the last 20 years, a study of what's called evolution of language. You know, libraries full of books, uh, articles appearing all the time, which is another very strange topic for a number of reasons. For example, it's interesting to compare it with a vastly simpler topic, say evolution of bee communication. Incredibly simpler. The bees are tiny little organisms. You know, brain the size of a grass seed. Uh, you can take it apart. You can do an invasive experiment you like. You can, uh, a lot of comparative evidence. There's about 500 species of bees and different communication systems are none. And they seem to do just as well whether they have one of these systems or not, which raises some questions, but uh, just as well biological in terms of biological success. So it's a really easy topic to study it, but it's very little study of it. Uh, take a look at the, do a database search. And the reason is it's just too hard. Uh, it's too hard to study uh, the evolution of uh, insect communication. Even it's hard to even figure out what it is. It's extremely hard to figure out the neurology of it, even though it's, it's tiny, you know. I think 800,000 neurons or something like that. And uh, as I say, you can do any experiment you like. So, so, so why is it that there's very little study of this simple topic and a huge amount of study of the a topic which is not only vastly more complex, but where we have no information, virtually no information. Actually, not zero, but virtually none. Uh, uh, but let's take a look at it because it tells you a good place to start in comparing these two things. What we do, first of all, is first of all, it's not evolution of language. When people talk about evolution of language, what they really mean or should mean is evolution of the capacity for language. Now, languages don't evolve. Like uh, English doesn't evolve. It changes. In fact, every generation changes, but it, that's not evolution. Uh, evolution is something that happens to an organic object, like the human capacity for language, and some biological system, so that can evolve. And uh, do we know anything about it? Maybe. We know one thing with a fair degree of confidence, and we know a second thing with less confidence, and that's about it. What we know with a fair degree of confidence is that the language capacity hasn't evolved in at least 50,000 years, or whatever, whatever the date is when the humans began to trek out of Africa, 50,000, 80,000, you know, some period like that. Uh, since then, there's no indication that there has been any evolution of the language capacity. Uh, what that means is that if you take, uh, say, an infant from uh, some isolated tribe and say the Amazon that's had no human contact and move him a couple of miles away to where they speak say Portuguese uh, the infant will learn Portuguese just like any other child and conversely and as far as we know there's no exception to that I don't know, haven't tried every case but there's a huge amount of evidence and it appears that there's just no detectable evolution if there is any it's extremely marginal which isn't all that surprising. I mean, this is a short period of time on an evolutionary time scale. So that's the one thing we know with 
a certain degree of confidence. The other thing which you can kind of surmise on the basis of indirect evidence, mostly archaeological evidence, is that if you go back uh, maybe you know, 100,000 years before that or maybe less, there's no indication that there was any such thing as human language. You know, that is the, you know, the great explosion in uh, artifacts, uh, complex indications of complex social structure, you know, uh, or, uh, the marking of uh, astronomical events, uh, some degree of symbolic behavior. Now, all of that seems to show up somewhere in that extremely tiny window, maybe 75,000 years ago, uh, something roughly like that. I mean, there's you know, speculations about earlier things like shells that look complicated and so on, but uh, there's a real... Uh, paleoanthropologists pretty well agreed that there's a very significant change there. Ian Tattersall is one who's written a lot about it. So it looks as though somewhere around then some sometimes called great leap forward developed in cognitive capacity in one of the many hominids that were around at the time. There were a lot of them. Uh, others have disappeared, probably. We got rid of them. We're, we're <coughs> predatory species. but uh, uh, And that uh, led to modern humans. Uh, anatomically modern humans that you can study from fossil evidence were around for hundreds of thousands of years before this. So in, a, in one of these hominids, which is anatomically pretty modern, maybe totally modern, uh, some change took place. Uh, presumably some change in the wiring of the brain, maybe some very small change in the wiring of the brain, uh, which provided uh, whatever it is uh, it's generally assumed that this explosion was connected with the emergence of language. It makes sense. It's hard to imagine a lot of these things without it. Uh, so maybe that uh, led to the emergence of language, and then uh, the, out of that, the uh, emergence of what we call human intelligence, cognitive capacity, uh, history, art, uh, symbolism, and so on and so forth. Uh, that's a surmise based on only that little bit of evidence, not much. And as far as evolution of the language capacity is, goes, you guys have strong hands, uh, it, uh, the, uh, that's about what we know. It's on that, thanks, very thin read that the whole huge explosion of literature of, on what's called evolution of language rests, which is pretty irrational in my opinion, but you know, as soon as you start studying ourselves, it's not surprise anthropologists, I think. As soon as you start studying ourselves, we get extremely irrational. Uh, we just find it hard to treat ourselves like other creatures in, in the world. And uh, these, I think, are examples of it. Well, is there, I go, uh, incidentally, this, if this is anywhere near correct, it means that the language capacity emerged, you know, millions of years after separation of our ancestors from other primates, and of course huge numbers of years after the separation from anything else, which again makes it seem, and they of course didn't stop evolving, they went their own ways, so, uh, uh, you know, as complicated as we are in other directions. Uh, so it, it does seem kind of unlikely from the outset that we could learn much from a study of animal uh, similarities, if you can find any. And uh, this shows up in other ways, too. So, for example, we can, uh, if, if you go to the, uh, there are things to say about animal communication systems, not much because they're so varied, uh, but there are some things you can say which seem fairly general. Uh, one is that all of them appear to be essentially signaling systems. So a certain event in the environment, you know, say vervet monkeys uh, you know, fluttering the leaves in the tree, will uh, cause a monkey who notices it to produce a, so uh, a noise, which we call a warning, warning signal. Who knows what the monkey thinks? But we call it a warning signal and the other monkeys start running away. Uh, meaning they're kind of taking it to be, you know, an eagle's coming or something like that. Uh, 
uh, and uh, there are other in, there are also internal, say, hormonal changes, which will lead to emission of a cry, you know, which, like, we interpret as meaning I'm hungry or something like that. And there's a fixed number of those. But there are signaling systems keyed to particular uh, physically identifiable stimuli, internal or external, and probably reflexive, but there's a debate about this. So Jane Goodall, for one, claims that her chimpanzees in the wild they can't help producing the relevant cry on the relevant occasion, internal or external. Others question this, this debate about it. But in any event, uh, keyed to identifiable physical events and signaling something. Other animals take it to be a signal of something. And that goes back to bacteria, you know, interchanging DNA and there are various techniques of communication, uh, it, which do lead to behavior and complex behavior. Uh, if there's an exception to this, it's not known. I think every case that's known is like this. Actually, one, uh, one of the main reviews of uh, the animal communication literature by uh, edited by Randy Gallistall, a very well-known cognitive neuroscientist. Uh, he simply states straight out that, as far as we know, in animal communication systems, every signal is one-to-one -one associated with an identifiable physical event, you know, external or internal. And there may be exceptions, but it seems very largely correct. Uh, uh, these systems can have various structure, animal communication systems, like the waggle dance of the bees is pretty complex. Uh, the uh, vervet monkey cries are pretty simple. But uh, uh, every known system, I think, has one of two formal properties. Either it's strictly finite, like vervet cries, or it's technically continuous, continuous like the dance of the bees. In principle, the bee can signal uh, the distance, height, uh, orientation of a flower uh, over a continuous range. So between any two choices, it can signal one in between, kind of like you know, real numbers on a straight line. Now, of course, in practice, you can't have an a analog system. Every analog system has to be interpreted through it. Uh, uh, discrete, in fact, finite grid, so there's some limit to this, but to the limits of perceptual capacity, it's probably a continuous system. And I think every system known is like that. Uh, so these are signal systems, maybe reflexive, if not close to it, uh, either continuous or, dis or finite. Uh, I think all the systems fall somewhere in that range. Well, when you turn to human language, which is an actual biological system, which you can study, kind of like the visual system, has none of these properties. It differs in every respect you can think of from any of the animal communication systems. And you can even raise the question whether it's a communication system at all. Of course, it's used to communicate, but everything we do is used to communicate. You know, your hairstyle, your, the clothes you wear, the way you walk. Uh, it's all signaling all kinds of things. Uh, and so similarly, uh, human language can be used to communicate. But when you say it is a communication system, you're really implying something different. You're implying its kind of core function is communication. Now, the notion of core function of an organic system is a pretty obscure one. So, like, what's the function of the skeleton, say? Well, helps you stay up, stores calcium, you know, uh, produces blood cells, does a lot of things. But when people talk about its function as being to maintain posture, what they're suggesting is something about the evolutionary history. So somehow skeletal systems evolved, you know, were selected for these purposes, maybe, maybe not. Uh, when people talk about, as they commonly do, by now it's a dogma, that uh, when, you, when you hear the dogma that language is a communication system, what is meant is it evolved out of communication systems. 
and then you get continuity with alleged continuity with animal communication and uh, all sorts of other fantasies based mostly on misinterpretation of a couple of sentences in Darwin, you know, actually he probably meant them, but no biologist does anymore, about how evolution has to move in very small steps. You know, it looked like that for a time, it doesn't look like that anymore. But uh, the, uh, and there's no reason to believe it. In fact, uh, this looks like a pretty clear case of pretty sharp discontinuity. Uh, in every respect, and not surprising from a biological point of view. So the major evolutionary biologists like, uh, say, François Jacob, Salva Laureate, two Nobel laureates who were interested in the topic, had no problem uh, regarding this as a plausible selection. And it doesn't raise any problems for evolutionary theory, serious evolutionary theory, but that's not the... You know, the popular story. The popular story is kind of a pop Darwinist story, which has much to do with evolutionary theory. Uh, the, the idea that language is and must be a communication system is actually pretty modern. There's a more traditional view, which holds that language is, in, is fundamentally, whatever that means, an instrument of thought, which of course can be used to express thought, uh, though it doesn't have to. And in fact, if you think about your own language use, just introspecting, uh, probably 99% of it is internal, and not even externalized. When you walk down the street, you can't help thinking in language, or what you call thinking in language. It takes a real act of will to try to prevent it. It's unstoppable all night, and so on. Uh, and that's practically all the use of language. That when you introspect a little further, which hasn't really been done much because psychologists have not been willing to study uh, real unconscious processes. They like to study observed behavior, uh, even Freudians and others. But if you try to introspect and imagine what it could be studied, uh, a lot of ways to possibly study it, I think what you perceive you might try is that you're not even speak to yourself in language, you're speaking, what, you, what you're getting is fragments, you know, like a word will appear, a phrase will appear, and, and you somehow have a sense of what that's supposed to be, and you can formulate a sentence from it. All of which suggests that most of what's going on is inaccessible to consciousness, like almost anything else we know about. And you have to find very indirect ways to try to understand what it is. Uh, but those would be the internal thought processes, whatever they are, which can be reached. Uh, internal expression in language can be externalized after you think about them, and that's what we hear, spoken language. Uh, but uh, that's a very different conception. That's, uh, the conception says that basically it's a thought system which, in which externalization is a secondary ancillary phenomenon which would, of course, mean that communication is an even more ancillary phenomenon. Yeah, but that's quite counter to the modern tradition. The modern tradition is it's a system of communication. Uh, an interesting question, why that arose, and not only arose, but literally became a dogma. You can't question it. My suspicion is it's the impact of uh, the behavioral science uh, you know, takeover in the 1950s, which sort of concentrated attention on behavior, modification of behavior, control of behavior, you know, making it seem sort of mystical to try to figure out what's inside and so on, which is, if, is totally unlike the way we study any organic system, any human or other system. You're interested in what's going on inside, not what's manifested. That's just data. You know. Uh, in fact, the very term behavioral science is a kind of an indication of what seems to me the deep irrationality of this whole movement. I mean, behavior is data. Some of the data for whatever is of interest, whatever's going on inside. I mean, we don't call physics meter reading science, even though the data is reading meters. Uh, yeah, you read the meters to try to figure out what's going on. Uh, and you can look at behavior because if 
if you look at it properly, it can tell you something about what's going on. Now, it's kind of striking that when we study non-cognitive systems, even in humans, that stance is taken pretty naturally. So take, say, visual perception. Uh, the visual system is a reasonable analog, to, you know, different, of course, to the language system. It's kind of a fairly integrated subsystem of the complex of systems that are integrated in the organism's behavior, what's loosely called an organ. Uh, and there's a lot known about the visual system. And it's interesting to see how it's known. Uh, some of it is known by uh, careful experimentation with uh, uh, you know, perceptual experiments. And out of this, a lot can be discovered. For those of you familiar with this stuff, it's what David Marr, one of the main theoreticians of vision, called at the computational level, the figuring out what kind of computations are being carried out by the visual system. So one of the most striking examples is uh, what's called the rigidity principle. Uh, Stephen Ullman, student of Mars. Uh, if, you're, if a person is given successive presentations, say on a tachistoscope, on a screen, of say three dots, not very many, maybe three or four successive presentations of three dots, what the person perceives is a rigid object in motion. It's pretty striking because the dots are not, they're just dots, you know. In fact, uh, why should we even impose rigid objects on the world? Our experience is with very few rigid objects in the world. And in non human worlds, almost none. And throughout the history of human evolution, people never saw rigid objects. That's not what you see when you're taking a walk in the woods. So, why is our visual system structured so that on virtually no evidence it constructs rigid objects in motion? Well, that's a, a deep discovery at the computational level, and the mathematics of it is kind of understood. There's some understanding of how that can happen. Well, that's the kind of evidence you can get from, from direct experimentation uh, on the visual system. But we have a lot more evidence about the visual system. We have a lot of evidence about the internal neurophysiology of it. And the reason we have that evidence is because our visual system is a pretty, apparently a pretty normal mammalian visual system. So you can do experiments with cats and monkeys, invasive experiments that you can't do with you. You're not allowed, to, not ethically not allowed to do with humans. You stick electrodes and striate cortex and things like that. And out of that you can get quite a lot of information about how the system is functioning even at the cellular level. And that is assumed to carry over to human vision. So uh, we have information about human vision from that source. Well, let's turn to language. Uh, we, almost all the information we have about human language is at the computational level. You can do experiments, meaning working with informants on uh, uh, data, how, how they interpret and understand sentences. Okay, you have plenty of data about that. And uh, some of it's quite interesting. And if you pick the things that are interesting, not just you know, sort them out of the mass of data like in any rational inquiry, uh, you can find properties that are quite remarkable and puzzling and require explanation, like the rigidity principle. So there's a lot of things like that. And I think they tell us a fair amount of, about what's called technically universal grammar, which just means the genetic capacity, the genetic basis for the language faculty. I'll tell you some interesting things about it. I'll mention one or two examples of this time. But we can't get evidence directly about the neurophysiology. Uh, because we're not allowed to do the right experiments. You can imagine how you could do them, uh, just as you can imagine raising children in controlled environments and so on. You might learn all sorts of things. Uh, but those are ruled out. And there's no comparative evidence. There's no other animal you can look at uh, that has anything like this system. So you're kind of stuck. Uh, they have to do highly indirect and 
fairly sophisticated work to find out anything at all about what the physiology is. And there actually is some, there are some results, but it's hard work. It's not like sticking electrodes into the brain and saying, okay, humans are like that too. You know, it's also hard work, but direct and easier. Well, that's, so what do you find when you're studying human language? Well, let's take some of the data that's kind of like the rigidity principle. You just look at things that people uh, understand. How much time do I have? Five minutes? No, I'll give you one simple example, which goes pretty far, I think. In fact, I think it goes as far as showing that language isn't a system of communication. Or, of course, it's used for it. Uh, so take, say, the sentence, uh, instinctively... Uh, eagles that fly swim. Easy sentence. I'll have to write it down. Instinctively, eagles that fly swim. And ask yourself what the adverb instinctively goes with. Does it go with fly or does it go with swim? Well, it goes with swim. You're talking about how instinctively they swim, even though the only thing that makes sense is instinctively they fly. Or take, suppose you ask a question about it. You say, can eagles that fly swim? Well, you're asking whether they can swim, not whether they can fly. No. Now, if you think about it for a minute, that's kind of puzzling. But why should it be? But why doesn't the element at the front of the sentence, instinctively or can, it has to find a verb. Why doesn't it find the closest verb? Why does it find the most remote verb? In fact, it doesn't even find the most remote verb if you have a long sentence, you find that's not what it's doing. What it's actually finding is the structurally closest verb, the one that's closest if you look at a hierarchic structure that's unordered, uh, then it picks the closest one. But that's a complex computation. Uh, in contrast, uh, finding the closest verb is a trivial computation. So how come we pick the complex computation and not the trivial one? And furthermore, why is this true for every construction in every language? Wide variety of constructions. And how does an infant know it instantaneously without evidence? Uh, children don't get any evidence about things like this. They can't. Uh, but no, no child ever. Um, children make what we call mistakes in language learning, which are usually following the rules of some other language. They don't yet know what language this is. But nobody ever makes these mistakes. Nobody's ever registered a mistake like that. Uh, so, so how come? You know? uh, well, you know, it's, it's the kind of question that was really never asked in thousands of years of quite intensive research into language. It wasn't really asked until about the 1950s when the first efforts were made to try to construct a precise account of what it is that we understand about language. And before that, it was taken to be kind of obvious nothing to say. You know, we read, say, Larry Bloomfield, the great linguist of the American, American linguist, and very fine linguist. He defined language as just uh, what can be expressed in a speech community. Okay, why can one of these things be expressed but not the other one? Well, that's a question that didn't come up. But as soon as you begin to, and that goes way back, but as soon as you begin to ask questions like that, all sorts of puzzles emerge right away. Uh, it's very reminiscent of the early moments, of very early moments of modern science when you know, people, oh, Galileo and others, allowed them to be puzzled about what were taken to be perfectly obvious things. You know, why does this thing fall but uh, steam rises, natural place? And so thousands of years that was taken to be a fine answer by the best scientists. When you begin to ask why, if you suddenly find everything is puzzling. You don't understand anything. Uh, and uh, the more you learn, the less you understand because more funny things come along. Well, it turns out there's a very interesting, hot, likely correct answer to this. The, take a look at the whole complex story. This included probably the case that uh, linear order, you know, linear means uh, early to late, left to right, it just isn't part of language. It's an ancillary part of language. Uh, of course, it's there. We speak in a sequence of words, not 
not in hierarchic structures or words simultaneously. But that's the property of the sensory motor system. When you try to get what's going on in your head out into a sensory motor system, you're forced to meet the conditions of the sensory motor system. But that's ancillary language. Uh, it's a secondary process, probably from an evolutionary point of view, too. So meeting those conditions imposes linear order. But the internal computations of language, the things that determine the meaning and structure of expressions, they don't seem to use order. There's a lot of it. This is a simple example, but there's much more complex examples. Well, just giving that simple case alone, I think what it implies, uh, it strongly, this and other things like it, suggest that externalization, that is putting the language out you know, into the external world, is just something tacked on to language, and probably in the history of evolution as well. And uh, if that's the case, then what's done with the externalization of language, like communication, is even more ancillary to language. Now, you look closely at this internal system of thought, I don't have time to talk about it. It turns out to be very well geared to some striking semantic properties of expressions, the way they're understood. And it kind of begins to look as though you know, language just evolved suddenly, emerged suddenly as a system of computation which linked to existing thought process, processes somehow. That is, if you like, kind of designed for that purpose in the informal sense of design. And the rest is just uh, tacked on somehow. And from there, you can go on. The uh, point is, just to make, is that from even looking at pretty simple cases, you immediately begin to see that there's a lot you can, a lot you, there's a lot you can discover about uh, uh, the fundamental nature of language and what it's used for. I just finally add one more thing on this. This is one of the few cases where there is interesting uh, neurophysiological, indirect neurophysiological evidence uh, correlating with it. Uh, there are studies, uh, mainly carried out at a lab in Milan, uh, where they've specifically investigated this question. And the way they, uh, the way, what all you can study about the brain is which parts are activated. You, know, you can't, I mean, with in, invasive experimentation, you could study more. But, uh, and what they found is in these experiments, I could describe them if you like, but uh, when, uh, basically when nonsense systems are invented that correspond to unknown human languages, unknown to the subject, then the normal brain areas are activated. Uh, when a nonsense uh, system is constructed that violates the rules of language, like, for example, using order. Uh, people can handle it, but it's treated kind of like a puzzle. There's diffuse, very diffuse activation in the brain. And so from these things, it looks as if whatever's going on in our brains is just structured so as to pick up these properties, specific properties of language. And there's a lot of evidence suggesting that that must be true when I stop there. <laughs> So, among the many things you saw illustrated was the uh, is the property that allowed Noam to hold forth for three hours every Thursday afternoon, and a troop of us would wander over from Harvard, but people came from miles around. Um, and we should have allotted three hours today, too, but we don't have that much time. Uh, but we do have time for one or two little questions. Uh, so if you would keep them short, um, then um, you know, I'll call on okay, back there. Um, actually, I have two questions, but they will ask be one. Uh, ask one? Yeah. So you started with uh, talking about uh, Alan Turing and the idea that uh, we can't really uh, ask meaningfully whether machines could think. And, and so the idea there was, I guess, that thought is not an object of scientific like inquiry. But uh, at the same time, doing the parallel to language, uh, 
it seems like you, you're saying, well, asking whether animals can have language is just asking a question which, is me, uh, which has no meaning like that, like the, whether machines can think. And so it's just like asking whether submarines can swim. But uh, I guess Turing was assuming that thought is across the board, not an object for scientific inquiry. It's, it's not, even in humans, like you cannot scientifically ask for Turing if humans think. It's, it's an ordinary common sense thing. It's not a, an object of scientific discourse. Uh, uh, and so I was wondering why you think there's a disanalogy here as Turing thought, you know, well, human thought, you know, common sense, machine thought, common sense too, we shouldn't ask questions about this, but you think that uh, animal language, that's just common sense, you know, you can make that It's not a matter of common sense. The point, what he was assuming, I th he didn't go into it, because I think he took it to be obvious, but it's pretty clear that what he meant when he said the question's too meaningless to deserve discussion, is that think is an informal term of human language. It means what it means in its normal usage. And in its normal usage, it's applied to a human activity. So the question whether machines can think is like asking whether submarines can swim. What metaphor do we decide to pick? And that's a meaningless question. I mean, you can, maybe there are reasons to pick one metaphor rather than another, but it's not a scientific question. And I think the same is true with animal language. Uh, animals have all sorts of communication systems. They're radically different than human language in just about every respect you can think of. There's no reason to believe they have any evolutionary connection with it. So if you want to call that language okay, then maybe a, you know, a, a, a flower is using language when it uh, attracts an insect. Okay. If you want to call that language, you can call it language. But it's not a factual question. And this is quite apart from the fact that animal language is not a category. You know, back, what bacteria do and what vervet monkeys do, quite different things. They are used to communicate. Other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, so you mentioned earlier that the, the notion that um, the production and responsive signals um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Take the microphone. Oh, much like. Um, <laughs> right. You said that um, the notion of the production and of and response to signals among most non-human animals can be key to physical, like hormonal, and um, external, environmental, and internal hormonal um, systems suggests that it's that the animal communication system is. It seems like we're suggesting that it's an, part of an, an inflexible system, but all that means, the fact that we can key um, communication to hormonal changes and to changes in the environment just means that we know how to explain it. It doesn't mean that that's all there is. And so I was wondering if you could just say a little bit more about that. Thank you. Well, there is, um, actually, let me just take the article I read this afternoon on Blue Nose, the language of Blue Nose dolphins. Uh, which is typical, you know, serious article, major cognitive science journal. It's about the experiments that were done to show how uh, blue-nosed dolphins have systems like human language. And the main topic was uh, what the investigators called reference. They can teach a blue-nosed dolphin to react to, say, this in one way and to this in a different way. So that means they have reference. Actually, what that shows is they do not have reference in the sense of human language, because that's not the way human language works. The human language does, the words of human language do not pick out physically identifiable objects. It's much more complex than that. Uh, so for example, uh, take say the word apple. Um, you can teach an, an ape laboriously to make a certain noise when you present somebody eating an apple or you know, an apple on a table or something like that. Uh, who knows what's going on in the mind of the ape. But that's not the way the word apple works in human language. I mean, an object might look precisely like an apple. Physically, it might be molecule by molecule identical with an apple. 
but if we discover that it was uh, constructed by uh, some kind of um, technical genius to look like an apple, then it wasn't. It's not an apple. Uh, whether it's an apple or not depends on things like design, function, uh, origin, history. Uh, uh, if it turns out, let's say that it's it's really that it's a genetically modified pear, which modified to look kind of like an apple. It's a pear. I don't care. It doesn't matter how much it looks like an apple. But that's the way all of human language works. And furthermore, this is known by infants, easily understood by infants. In fact, if you think about it, the children's fairy stories are based on it. So a standard children's fairy story is. Uh, you know, uh, the handsome prince is turned by a wicked witch into a frog and has all the physical properties of a frog. It, from a physicist's point of view, he's a frog. And finally, the beautiful princess kisses him and he, out comes the handsome prince. Well, the infant knows it was the prince all along. It doesn't matter what it looked like. You know, it's the prince because of what's called psychic continuity. We individuate persons and animals in terms of a, something we impose on the world, called psych, which you can call psychic continuity. It means they kind of run, the same person runs through it. Uh, a lot of science fiction is based on playing games with this. But the point is it's instantly known by infants. It's physically undetectable, uh, except by looking on what's going on inside the mind. And you can't think of a word in human language which isn't like this. So it's not just that they're not used to signal, and of course not used reflexively, but they don't even have reference in this sense. So when you show that blue-nosed dolphins have this kind of reference, you're not showing that it's like human language, you're showing that it's radically different from human language. And as soon as you look at human language, yeah, you see that. But the trouble is almost the entire literature on this refuses to look at human language. I mean, it's trying to study you know, what you can learn about human language from this, that, and the other thing, but don't look at human language. I mean, it's as if we were trying to study the waggle dance in the crazy way I mentioned, training grad students. But in addition, we refuse to look at properties of the waggle dance. I mean, that would be so irrational, you can't even formulate it. But that's the way practically the whole literature works. Take a look and see. I mean, this article is a perfectly sophisticated article, a fine journal, it's typical of this. But there is a very funny fact which anthropologists, and maybe are, certainly should be interested in, and that is why we get so totally irrational when we're trying to think about ourselves. <laughs> well, I'm tempted to let you keep on asking questions, but I'm also reminded that yesterday's keynote was telling us what anthropologists should do and shouldn't do and what open questions there are. And since this is such a nice ring composition with no time, that's what anthropologists should think about. I think let's call this session to an end and invite the closing panel to come up. But before doing that, let's thank them once again for joining us. This session.